Can we start? <laughs> oh. Yeah. So everybody, we come back. Now. So everybody is there, I hope. Let's go to the first session, which is the fundamental element of our conference, which is the genesis of the non-aligned movement. So we will have five speakers. And I allowed myself to make, to put into order based on alphabetical names of the leaders, the five leaders of the non-aligned movement. So starting from Nasser, Nehru, Nkrumah, Sukarno, and Tito. But before that, I, am, I have a pleasure to give you a surprise, pleasing surprise, because we have a witness, physical, biological, uh, personal witness of the Belgrade conference in 1961 in the person of Lilia Pavlovich Deer. She was a school girl when the Belgrade conference or be organized. So I will invite Lilia Pavlovich Deer, who is artist from Serbia, based in France, in Paris, and she was a professor of art in uh, U UCLA in United States. Now she is based in Paris. So Lilia, please. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Darvis, and go good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Um, I, uh, I, I'm thankful for inviting me here as a witness of uh, Belgrade um, conference in uh, 1961. In fact, I was uh, um, just finishing primary school at that time, and uh, um, I could uh, see uh, the event. Um, Tito was organizer of that Belgrade uh, conference of non-allied countries. As, as you know, non-allied countries uh, didn't belong to either Eastern or Western Bloc, they've been independent. Um, with actually uh, quite a nostalgic memory, I remember that we all went to the streets to greet the presidents of various countries, which were driving through the big avenues. Uh, and uh, I believe that some cars were um, open the roof, because we can see clearly, for instance, uh, presidents uh, like uh, um, uh, Sokarno with his hat, special hat, and then um, Nasser, uh, Nero, Nero was always dressed in white with a rose on his coat. Uh, later on, uh, in some other um, conferences, his uh, daughter Indira Gandhi uh, came also to the conferences. And uh, um, she and uh, Sirimavo Bandaranaike, who was from Sri, Sri Lanka, were also dressed in beautiful dresses, as well as uh, uh, many African countries' presidents were dressed in uh, their uh, special uh, uh, national costumes. Um, also, at that time, uh, Castro, for instance, was uh, Fidel Castro from Cuba, uh, was uh, um, very young president, as well as uh, Gaddafi from Libya, who was less than uh, 30 years old, I believe, or, or around that. Uh, um, I would like to uh, 
say that at that time it was like a great energy and optimism in building the future and uh, um, that is uh, not so much case today when the world is uh, has a lot of problems starting from COVID-19 we are entering into second year of uh, this pandemic as well as the racial problems which I have impression increased and uh, um, climate, of course, issues, which are very important. And I hope that uh, presidents of uh, all the countries will uh, have a meeting and talk about solving those problems so that we have a future on our planet. Um, I would like to actually mention one Greek myth about uh, um, goddess which are weaving of all be uh, destiny of all beings on on the planet and uh, they are surveying if uh, um, somebody will cross the border of universal balance and those who cross the border of universal balance are thrown into the precipice uh, so that is uh, uh, <laughs> something which we should think about when, you, when we think about climate changes, that we should respect our planet and build a nicer future. Thank you. Thank you, Lilia. You're welcome. Thank you, Lilia. So now uh, let's go to the first speaker, uh, Mohammed El Shim. Are you there? Oh. No, it seems that uh, he is not there. But uh, that's true since sometimes I didn't have his news, but he, he answered last time his confirmation. But now he doesn't show up. So let's go then to let's go to Professor Mohanti, who will speak about Nehru as one of the initiator of the Belgrade Non-Aligned Conference. So, uh, Professor Mohanty is, Thank Thank I you. have written, I, I'm looking for, yes, retired professor of political science from University of Delhi, Honorary Fellow, former Chairperson, Institute of Chinese Studies, Distinguished Professor, Editor of Social Change and Council for Social Development, based in Delhi. Now, time is yours, Professor Mohanty. Thank you. Thank you, Darvis. This is a great moment to celebrate a great tradition. And uh, that... Uh, uh, you know, note from uh, uh, Lilia was really moving. It uh, re-energizes us. And uh, this is a group of optimists. We are determined to remember the legacies of our freedom struggle and uh, what the vision of the anti-colonial forces, anti-colonial movements in different countries, different continents of the world, uh, had and uh, the Bandung conference enshrined them uh, into Bandung principles, Bandung declaration, and Belgrade conference further consolidated and took them forward. Now, um, before I come to Nehru, I think we should remember that uh, we thought that colonialism came to an end with the a transfer of political power to the natives. But we found that neocolonialism continued. 
and took new forms. And the Bandung Conference warned us about that. So after colonialism, we had the Cold War. And that is when the Belgrade Conference addressed you know, the uh, severe restriction on freedom of people in the newly independent countries particularly. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, we responded to the Cold War. And now during the last 30, 40 years, neoliberal globalization has created new challenges of generating inequalities, environmental problems, climate change, violence, alienation, leading to terrorism of many kinds and so on. And the COVID experience has actually crystallized all the contradictions very, very frontally in terms of uh, the, what the development strategy that colonialism gave to the world and neoliberalism has further consolidated has created for the world. And our freedom struggle in India, Indonesia, China, Latin American countries, African countries, I think had already warned us. And Nehru's life illustrates that. In fact, uh, I think the best way to uh, put Nehru's contribution to the uh, formation of the non-alignment doctrine is to say that this is actually a product of our freedom struggle and the freedom struggle of Indonesia, of uh, Egypt, of uh, uh, Yugoslavia, in what conditions it did not want to join uh, as a subordinate partner of the Soviet Union, uh, nor uh, you know, of the West, but have uh, uh, independent uh, choices to exercise. Uh, therefore, the, uh, the context is that of the freedom struggle, the anti-colonial struggle against colonialism and then against the Cold War. And now in the context of neoliberal globalization, capitalist globalization, and now the COVID pandemic. Now, um, you know, Nehru attended the International Congress of Oppressed Nationalities in Brussels in February, 1927. And so that anti-imperialist dimension has been a part of the Indian National Congress-led freedom struggle. He also visited the Soviet Union later that year and was quite impressed by the achievements of socialist construction. You know, when he wrote in Glimpses of World History, really glimpses, they were a bunch of letters really uh, to uh, his daughter Indira Gandhi uh, and he wrote them in prison. Uh, he had already analyzed uh, the various problems of alliances and had positively mentioned the newly independent nation, the United States, remaining neutral from 1812 onwards for many years and occasionally later on also, though later on it became the leader of an alliance and leader of one uh, side of the Cold War. Uh, but more so in Discovery of India, Nehru, in his other famous book, which he wrote in prison uh, in 1942-44, uh, 45, that period. In Discovery of India, he really talks about uh, the emergence of Asia. That is why the Rise of Asia Conference and the uh, Nehru uh, legacy are very clearly linked. And how... Asian countries were emerging as forces of freedom, independence and freedom analyzed in terms of not only political freedom, but also economic freedom for the oppressed people, for the poor, for the working people, uh, and social freedom for all uh, groups. Uh, so uh, discovery of India and glimpses of, glimpses of world history are two sources of his ideas, which he later on evolved into non-alignment. But one concrete historical experience really put Gandhi and Nehru uh, 
uh, in a very special situation to make a choice. And that was during the Second World War. Fighting fascism on the one hand and opposing the British imperialist forces on the other. In fact, one section of the Indian National Congress led by Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose formed the Azad Hind Forge, Indian National Army, and joined the Axis powers. In fact, fought on the side of the Japanese in the Eastern Front. So they thought, and uh, the Axis powers had promised him that they would get, they would give India independence. They would secure India independence. Another section in the Indian National Congress wanted that, you know, uh, particularly after Soviet Union was attacked by Germany, uh, uh, that Indian National Congress must join the Allied forces and strengthen the Allied forces against fascism. But Gandhi and Nehru, who were of course determined to fight against fascism, but also wanted to intensify their struggle against British imperialism. And because Britain under Churchill was still reluctant to uh, give independence to India. So, and they decided in August 1942 to launch the Quit India Movement. And Gandhi's tiring call in Mumbai, uh, do or die, must force the British to leave India. Now, that was a great moment. On the one hand, opposing fascism, opposing British imperialism. So that showed the possibility of a substantive non-aligned position which can emerge as an independent political force in world affairs. This was Quit India Movement 1940. Well, uh, as I said, you know, similar things were happening in Indonesia. And in 1945, preamble of the Indonesian constitution, I'm sure um, uh, Darvish will refer to the Indonesian case. Similar things were happening in uh, uh, Yugoslavia. And Tuto had already shown independent uh, line uh, in 19, by 1945. Uh, and uh, when Nehru became prime minister uh, on the 1st of September, 1946, in the interim government first, he made a radio address on the 7th September, where he spelt out India's attitude towards the world. And he spelt out five principles, not the famous Panchashil later on, these are other five principles. Supporting the emancipation and independence of people and countries. Then equal opportunity of all races. That is why India and the entire non-aligned movement and Bandhu movement were, you know, against the apartheid and against racism right from then till now. Keeping away from politics of groups aligned against one another. So here is non-alignment as principle number three in the foreign policy articulation of Nehru in his radio broadcast in September, 1946. Four, working for peace and avoidance of wars. That is why peace disarmament became very important and already the nuclear threat had emerged. Therefore, uh, this became very important, the issue of peace and avoidance of wars. And five, working towards building a world commonwealth of free cooperation of free peoples where there was no exploitation, social exploitation. And he refers to, refer to class exploitation in particular. Now these five principles uh, of Indian foreign policy were uh, spelled out by Nehru in 1946. Uh, another major uh, reference to, um, you know, Gandhi's uh, articulation of this view uh, uh, was in his uh, reply to P.C. Joshi, the CPI, the Communist Party of India, uh, General Secretary uh, in 1940, also earlier in 1942, in writing in Harijan, his paper. Uh, because uh, after the Soviet Union was attacked, uh, uh, you know, Joshi wrote to Gandhi that Congress should join the war uh, on the side of the allies to fight 
Axis powers, fascism. Gandhi said, we are placed between Sheila and the Charbides. Either way, that will be shipwreck. I would rather sell staying at center. How many minutes more? Uh, uh, well, you, I... you are supposed to speak 15 minutes. <laughs> How many minutes more? Uh, five minutes, okay. Okay, thank you. So Gandhi from 1942 onwards and Nehru even earlier, and Nehru said all this also in the Constituent Assembly. Now, uh, I want to refer to uh, a speech that uh, Nehru made in Parliament uh, on 9th December 1958. This was, you know, much after the Bandung Conference, where already the non-aligned uh, foreign policy of many countries had, had been articulated. Uh, what I have done is to give voice, he said, to, to this policy. I have not originated it, Nehru says. And of course, then uh, he talked about uh, several sources, particularly in the Indian context. It was inherent in the circumstances of India. In other words, it was the most preferred strategic policy for India in, those, in that situation. Then inherent in the past thinking of India, this is made much of by talking about the Buddhist tradition, uh, Gandhi's uh, focus on ahimsa, non-violence, uh, and so on. Uh, I think uh, Ker Naren and former president of India uh, puts it very well when he says that the pluralist, ethnic, religious, linguistic tradition of India, how tolerance, reconciliation, and mutual respect uh, and equality of status for all these religions was the continuing theme in India's pluralist history. That is the past thinking, which inspired non-aligned movement, which respects difference of political systems, social systems, and at the same time, trying to uh, work together for peace and social justice. That is about past thinking of India. Then. Inherent in the whole mental outlook of India and inherent in the conditioning of the Indian mind. So to this, he adds, and his Belgrade speech also makes it very clear, and his Bandung speech makes it very clear, that it is the modern global history's choice of a preferred future, path to a preferred future. This is why if you take all this together, the theory and practice of non-alignment uh, globally and in Indian case, it is not merely a strategy, let alone a tactic. It is a, it is a broader perspective. And uh, this broader perspective includes a multi-pronged approach to fighting domination, colonialism, neocolonialism, and inequalities of all, of all sorts. And that is why today we have the political economy of geopolitics, gender, environment, you know, so many dimensions are part of the Ram perspective and the Bandung spirit perspective. Uh, this is why some years ago in India, a group of scholars talked about uh, non-alignment non -alignment point two. Uh, I don't like this point two, three. I think all historical movements continue to evolve. So if Bandung represented the ideology of liberation from colonialism, Belgrade inaugurated a new wave of seeking democracy, egalitarianism, freedom of freedom and peace, which were the issues of Cold War politics. And today, new forms of hegemony are threatening us, especially sharpened by COVID. And now the Belgrade outlook alerts us to face up to them 
and fight with a new moment of solidarity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mohanty. Now, uh, uh, we will go to Africa. We will learn about Nkrumah. And I will invite Amzat Bukhari Yabara. Now, he succeeded to join us. He sent me a message that he had a difficulty to join. Now, he succeeded. Now, Amzat, you will speak about Nkrumah and his role in non-aligned movement and beyond. And I will present you as a doctor in African history and civilization. And you are teaching at the African Political School of Paris. And you are also the general secretary of the Pan-African League, Umoja, a political movement based in almost 20 countries in Africa and diaspora. And among your works, the most, the, the latest and important bo book is a book on Africa Unite, a history of Pan-Africanism. And it was, it is in French, and we hope that it will be translated into English. Now, Amzat, your turn. If it is possible, 15 minutes, is it okay? It's okay. It's a, it's a pleasure. Greetings, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today for this conference on the 60 years of uh, the Belgrade Conference. Um, I would like to thank Darwis and the whole organization that made this conference possible. And um, my intervention is on Kwame Nkrumah, but you should know that we have um, a project of book of publication with the biography of the main uh, leaders of the non-aligned movement. So in my presentation, I will just give an introduction and a recontextualization of the role of Kwame Nkrumah and above all, the role of Pan-Africanism in the non-aligned and the Bandung movement. Uh, we have three sessions on Africa and uh, my intention is to give a little insight in this uh, issue of Pan-Africanism and non-alignment. So before I um, introduce Kwame Nkrumah in the great five of the non-aligned mov movement, uh, I must give a flashback and a focus on how Nkrumah became the, the guiding light of the Pan-African movement and why Pan-Africanism is a central political ideology to discuss when we speak of non-alignment. Um, First of all, the Pan-African historical experience was born in the Americas and the West Indies. It was born far away from Asia. The movement was born in the struggles of millions and millions of deported and enslaved peoples who identified blackness with Africa. So the issue of race, the race consciousness, is very central to uh, Pan-African issue. It's a race consciousness movement against the European developed system of racism, which exploited African labor and resources since six centuries until now. So Pan-Africanism is a challenge to uh, the worldwide domination of white supremacy. It's a challenge to slavery and colonial capitalism yesterday and neoliberalism today. So it is a challenge to the racial and capitalist division of the world. This is why it makes sense in the context of the Bandung Conference and the non-aligned movement. At the first Pan-African Conference in London in 1900, the African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois delivered a famous statement. He said that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. This prophetic statement of W.E.B. Du Bois was made 55 
years before the Afro Asian Bandung Conference. The color line already united Asian and African diasporas in the Western colonial world and even in the treatment of blacks and Indians in South Africa. Precisely, many so called colored peoples who were living in colonial or Western societies had inherited a sense of hostility towards anything that is in relation with Africa. On the other side, we got solidarities like uh, Ho Chi Minh, who was inspired by Marcus Garvey in uh, his meetings in New York. Uh, we have W.B. Du Bois, who traveled in Asia to meet with um, Mao and Nehru. He visited the Soviet Union. So the Pan-African movement uh, did not wait the rise of communism to ask for a better distribution of wealth and to denounce the rape of land and natural resources. But communism and Pan-Africanism developed a strong and controversial relations in the interwar period with black Marxist thinkers like Ciela James, who was in relation with Trotsky. Uh, also George Padmore, Negro Bureau of the Comintern until he resigned in 1934. Africans and Asians were struggling together in French and British trade unions. They were working in Brussels with the League Against Imperialism in 1927, or in London and Paris with um, anti-colonial networks. In the first half of the 20th century, Garveyism, Pan-Africanism and Communism built the network of a black internationalist movement. In October 1945, a new Pan-African movement emerged at the Manchester Congress. The 1945 Pan-African Congress is a milestone in the counter history of decolonization. During this Congress, we got a declaration to the colonial workers, farmers and intellectuals. We got a declaration challenging the colonial powers. We got a memorandum to the United Nations and we have resolution like a refusal of African seamen to transport ammunition uh, to help French, Dutch, and British imperialists that were trying to reimpose foreign domination over Asia. Kwame Kuma, an African, took control of the Pan-African movement in 1945, and he was working with, with uh, George Padmore, and Padmore proposed resolution conveying solidarity with the Indian struggle, with Indonesia, with Vietnam. We also got a declaration of support from the Federation of Indian Association in the UK to the Pan-African movement. So this connection between Africans and Asian has a long story and Bandung is a little bit uh, a decisive turning point. In 1945, Kuma just spent 10 years in the US before he moved to the UK. In 1947, he decided to go back home in the British colony of Gold Coast. After a political battle of 10 years, in 1957, Ghana became the first African independent country south of the Sahara. So I am interested in Kuma as he introduced in Africa the best of Pan-Africanism, Garveyism and socialism. Once he took power in Gold Coast in 1951, his country became the place where many African Americans and Caribbeans decided to go back. In 1957, he put the black star on the flag of Ghana, the newly independent country. And next point, he also developed a socialist analysis of the colonial situation in Gold Coast and all over Africa that would drive him to write his book on Neo-colonialism, the last stage of imperialism. Another point, Kuma had a global vision of the international relations. He made understandable the historical development of the idea of Pan-Africanism in a very decisive and positive way. He knew the impact of the whole Asian liberation movements. For instance, he used boycott and positive action inspired from the India inspired from the Indian anti-colonial resistance. He connected with civil rights movement, anti-nuclear campaign, anti-apartheid movements and armed liberation movements. 
this Pan-African vision was aligned with some of the Bandun principles, and it took the invitation to the Asian 1955 conference as a preparation to take its place in the United Nations. I quote, the invitation extended to the Gold Coast to participate in the recent Bandung conference, he said, is eloquent testimony of the recognitions of this country in international affairs. The Gold Coast is a symbol and this inspiration of renaissance Africa. As such, it is a privilege and a responsibility for us to make our experiment a success. Kuma himself decided not to go to Bandung, but he sent an observer, uh, an observer delegation with Kojo Botsio, Michael Day Anang, and Markham. You could not miss the delegation in their shining and colorful kente wearings. Kuma was in power in 1951, but his country was still a colony. In 1955, he was still engaged in negotiation with the colonial office in order to fix the day of the independence of Gold Coast. This is why the British did everything to prevent the Gold Coast delegation from traveling to Bandung. British knew that the rising of Asia was calling for the rising of Africa. French also knew that a coalition, including Kuma, Nasser, and the nationalists from Cameroon and Algeria and Vietnam would be very dangerous for colonialism. In the meantime, both the United States and the Soviet Union pushed for decolonization of French and British Africa, not because Moscow and Washington were anti-colonialist, but because they were imperialist. In the Cold War, the US wanted to use Africans, especially French Africans, against communism, and the Soviet Union tried to convince African decolonized countries that socialism was a superior system which could transform and develop the backward era destroyed by Western capitalism. Ghana and Egypt were the two main leading African nations that refused to support one side against another one. Accra and Cairo became an axis of the African non-aligned movement born after Bandung between 1955 and 1961 in Belgrade. Kuma had a strong background in Pan-Africanism, Black nationalism and socialism, but he believed in a positive non-alignment or a positive neutrality. At the independence of Ghana, he made a famous statement telling that the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. He was prime minister with the portfolio of Minister of Defense and External Affairs, working with George Padmore, his, his official advisor on African affairs, and thus Kuma advocated a foreign policy deeply committed to the principles and goals of non-alignment and pan-Africanism and to the fight against imperialism. It raised several challenges and potential controversies. First, a challenge to pan-Africanism because pan-African movement was conceived by Africans out of Africa and in the time of decolonization, African countries took independence without unity and engaged in the impossible building of some state nations instead of building an African federal state, like Cheikh Diop used to say. Kuma could rely on his connection with African Americans and West Indians, but Pan-Africanism became an African continentalism. Next, a challenge to because Kuma dreamed of a united Africa against imperialism, but in a kind of imperialistic way. It was, and we are still in the times of the large geopolitical groups. Kuma's position, and generally speaking, African positions regarding non-alignment with the West or the East, were difficult to keep since Africa itself was divided by foreign imperialists and later was divided by the, the, the Chinese and Russian split. Third, a challenge to non-alignment, since many critics explained that Kuma's conception of African unity was, an, was um, a call to align behind his own position. But in reality, Kuma was forced to align behind the other African head of states, mainly neo-colonial head of states, who refused his proposal for a continental African government 
that would preserve the global sovereignty of Africa. Kuma's independent and sovereign policy of non-alignment was based on the country's obligation to the United Nations Charter, the position in relation to Africa and the Commonwealth, the adherence to the principles enunciated at the Bandung and Accra conferences, and thus the mint an active engagement in international peacekeeping activities. Indeed, Kuma strongly believed in the role Ghana could play in solving crises and conflicts in the Middle East and in Asia. Besides, he was overthrown in February 1966 while traveling for a diplomatic mission in Corrie regarding uh, the American war in Vietnam. Kuma could cooperate with the East or the West and he did it. He also could use nonviolent positive action and passive non-cooperation. Cooperation is state-to-state -state relation. Solidarity is people-to-people -people relations. His conception of solidarity was defined by the five principles, namely non-aggression, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality, mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence. Those guiding principles are really important since we are working today to redefine the non-aligned movement. And we have to tackle some decisive, decisive issue, like the issue of racism, including racism suffered by black peoples in Asia and in the Arab world today. It is very important. And also the seemingly colonial and neo-colonial policies of Asian powers in Africa today. Those, this, those are issues that we need to address today. It is even more important for French Africa that is still under French neocolonial domination. How could we open a period of a second decolonization in Africa through the reconceptualization and the recontextualization of, on one side, a new Pan-African movement, and on the other side, a non-aligned status? Pan-Africanism was and remains an alternative to the nation state model imposed upon Africa by the West. But the initiative, if we speak of revolutionary Pan-Africanism, was strongly rejected. The search for alternatives is still on today. Globally speaking, how I could introduce Kuma and his political ideology, Pan-Africanism, in this um, 60 uh, years on from the non-aligned Belgrade conference. I give some indication that we should further and deeper in the panel dedicated to Africa, but also in the panels dedicated to Asia and Latin America. I hope that our next panels and discussion uh, will give us light not to miss new geopolitical opportunities uh, that could be unveiled in this 21st century. I thank you very much. Thank you, Amzat. Thank you, thank you. Now it is my own turn. <laughs> uh, well, I will check again if Muhammad El Shim is there or not. I didn't see uh, entering. Well, I, I I don't think that he is there. Okay. Uh, well, I don't think that I will introduce myself. I am the, well, the initiator, coordinator, convener of this conference <laughs> with the collaboration of all of you and with the help of all my students of master's degree in exchange with Asia, we celebrate this year the 30th anniversary. Uh, so I will share, I will, well, my summary my abstract has been available on the website of Bandung Spirit. We have just put online the available abstract until yesterday on the website. Uh, so my abstract included, and Amzat as well, and also Jovan as well. Uh, so uh, I just want to say what is uh, first, what I will say, uh, I will share my screen. I will share my PowerPoint. Where is it? I have to 
find out because there are so many windows open. Now, yes, I think it is possible. Yes, here you are. Do you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, we can see it now. Yeah. Yes. So, well, this is my idea uh, to put Sukarno in global history and his role in the non aligned movement. So, what I am going to say is that Sukarno represent the century, uh, the 20th century, from the decline of capitalism and then the rise of the colored people, as mentioned by uh, Amjad, and then the also the set destiny of Sukarno is also a, a preset the fall of Soviet Union and the comeback of imperialism after the fall of Soviet Union. And Sukarno represents perfectly this tragedy of 20th century. So I will refer when I speak about global history, my ref reference is, of course, the work of Professor Samir Amin. So I will talk quickly uh, the global history and where is the position of Sukarno in global history. So this is the schematically presented. I make a, a quick summary of the global history according to the work of Samir Amin, La trajectoire du capitalisme historique, la vocation tricontinental du marxisme. Well, we, our world is ruled by a system. And according to Samir Amin, the system is capitalism. And it is not started at the 20th century, but it's a long time ago, the gestation starting from 1000. So Samir Amin divided into three historical period of capitalism from gestation uh, 1000 until 100, uh, 1800. Uh, this is the transition of tributary capitalism to European market mercantilism and marked by European conquest of America, slavery, genocide of indigenous population in Latin America, in North America, in Australia, etc. And then come to the maturity marked by the British Industrial Revolution, French Revolution, uh, European conquest of Africa and Asia, but also Marxism, communism, utopianism, and then the independence of Latin America. And then capitalism came into decline starting from the end of 19th century, uh, marked by the monopoly capitalism, and then recurrent crisis, two world wars. And then during this crisis, we see the rise of the peripheries of capitalism. So, and then followed by the Bandung Conference as the, the first manifestation of this, the rise of these peripheries of capitalism. So this is very quick outlook of global history, uh, according to Professor Samir Amin. And I try to look at Sukarno according to this uh, framework. So this is the context. The context is the rise of the peripheries of capitalism or the colored people 
as uh, uh, Amzat uh, mentioned. Uh, marked by India, Egypt, China, Indonesia, Russia, Turkey are rising starting from the beginning of 20th century. And where is Sukarno in this position? This is the element, biogra bi biographical element of Sukarno. He was born in 901. This is the birth of Sukarno. At the age of 16 years old, when he was in high school, he got to know with Marx and Marxism. And it happened with the October Revolution of Russia. So Sukarno, start, starting from this year, he adopted the teaching of Marx and he declared himself as a Marxist. And at the age of 25 years old, when he was student and uh, engineering student, uh, he, well, uh, Sukarno is also a prolific writer and orator. So he write an article, uh, 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 make a sy synthesis, uh, synthesis of Marxism, Islamism, and nationalism. So uh, I would like to just uh, mention his here. He used the word Islamism. It is very interesting. While the word Islamism is used now as ideology based on Islam, but Sukarno at that time, I don't know why he used Islamism uh, instead of Islam. So Marxism, Islamism, and nationalism. He is convinced, convinced that there is no contradiction between Marxism, Islam, and nationalism. And the three have to be united in order to liberate all the colonial, colonialized countries. So this article is his conviction that he will where he will uh, uh, is his conviction until the end of his life. That's why bef just before his fall, Sukarno, uh, the uh, Indo Indonesian ideology or Indonesian force is based on NASACOM, nationalism, communism, and religion. Until the communism was defeated eradicated completely in 1966, 67 in, the, in, in Indonesia. 1930, Sukarno was in trial, was in the court of Dutch colonial court because of his activities. And he wrote during his period in prison, the Indonesia Mangukat, which became a manifesto of the Indonesian independent. The foundation of independent Indonesia was based on this book written by Sukarno during his uh, period in prison. And in 1945, Sukarno formulated Pancasila or five principles, which became the ideological foundation of Indonesia. As you know, Indonesia, is the biggest Muslim country in the world, but it is not Islamic country. It is based on Pancasila. First, the supremacy of one God, without mentioning what God is it. Is, is it God of Hindu, of Islam, of Christian? But first, the supremacy of belief, of the faith in one God. The second, humanity. The third, unity, national unity. The fourth, democracy. And the fifth, social justice. This is the foundation of Indonesian independence. And in 1955, then Indonesia initiating the Bandung Conference that uh, I'm going to speak a little bit after. And in 1960, Sukarno was designated by the African and Asian countries as the representative of the group, Asian African group of UN. And he gave the speech, which is fundamental speech, monumental speech on to build the world anew in front of uh, UN. 
uh, Assembly General. And then after that, of course, the tragic life of Indonesia. Uh, well, Sukarno promoting Nefos, all Devos, new emerging forces, and then with the the the, the tension between military and communism, with the with the military, Indonesian military was supported by Western bloc at the time until the communism was completely destroyed in Indonesia. This is the end of Sukarno. Now, Bandung Conference, I will say some word. It's the biggest international conference outside the UN, outside the two blocks of superpowers. 29 newly independent countries of Africa and Asia, two thirds of mankind outside the Western world, the birthday of the non-aligned movement and the third world, the entering of the third world into world politics. With the, Sukarno was the host of the conference. And then Nehru, one of the very important uh, inspiring uh, leader from India. And then we have also Chu Enlai, who played very important role in the Bandung Conference and become a star of the Bandung Conference. And of course, you have Nasser uh, as, as uh, uh, representing um, uh, Africa and Middle East and Arab world. And also, you don't, many people forget that the initiator the idea came from Ali Sastro Amijoyo, who was the prime minister of Indonesia at that time. So I put here the picture of Ali Sastro Amijoyo. And then I will speak about what we call Bandung principles. What is Bandung principle? It is the 10 principle, very famous. I will quote because it is very important. First, respect for fundamental human rights and for the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all nations. Recognition of the equality of all races and of the equality of all nations, large and small. Abstention from intervention or not interference in internal affairs of another countries. Respect for the rights of each nation to defend itself singly or collectively in conformity with the Charter of United Nations. Abstention from the use of arrangement of collective defense to serve any particular interest of the big powers. Abstention by any country from exerting pressure on other countries. Refraining from acts or threats of aggression or the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any country. Settlement of all international disputes by peaceful means such as negotiation, conciliation, arbitration, or judicial settlement, as well as other peaceful means of the parties' own choice in conformity with the Charter of the United Nations. Promotion of mutual interest and cooperation, respect for justice and international obligation. This is what is called Bandung Principle which become the reference of Belgrade conference and non-aligned movement until today. And other words coming out from the Bandung conference is the Bandung spirit. And there is no definition of Bandung spirit, but I try to make a condensed uh, summary of Bandung spirit, the core values of Bandung spirit is this. First, peaceful coexistence of diversity of political and economical system. 
Second, liberation from any kind of domination. The third, equality between races and nations. Four, solidarity towards the weak, the poor, the disadvantaged, the oppressed. Fifth, the emancipation of people-centered development. Now, we come to Belgrade. Non-Aligned Conference 1961, with the principle that the country should have adopted an independent policy based on the coexistence of states with different political and social systems and on non-alignment or should be showing a trend in favor of such policy. In 1961, only 25 countries participating in the conference. Now, the non-alignment movement has 120 countries of member from Africa, Asia, Latin America, Europe. And the leaders, which is the, we are speaking now is the five, the initiative of five. So uh, I put it alphabetically, Nasser, Nehru, Kruma, Sukarno, and Tito. Now, what is the place and the role of Sukarno? Well, yeah, and then this is, uh, I must say some words. During the, 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 the Belgrade conference, there was a very tense debate, especially, especially between two groups, a groups that want to liquidate quickly colonialism. So the struggles must continue to end colonialism. And the second group that uh, based on the uh, certainty that colonialism is uh, passing away. Now we have to go uh, prioritize peace because during the, uh, the, the Belgrade conference, the tension is very hot between the West Bloc and East Bloc. And during even the conference, the Soviet Union are announced that the, 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 the how do you say the, the nuclear essay. Uh, so it is very tense a conference. So the two blocks, uh, very hot debate. And these two blocks, in fact, uh, uh, not two blocks, two, two groups in the conference is led in one hand by Sukarno, who is very, uh, how do you say, uh, strong man of uh, anti-colonialism. And the Nehru, who is uh, in favor of peace rather than struggling, continuing struggling for uh, colonialism, because in his view, colonialism is passing away. Uh, but finally, both the, 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 the Belgrade Declaration is the synthesis of these two groups. But what is interesting is that one of this group that is behind Sukarno, uh, the radicalist group, what is what I call radicalist group, continue to work together, and that this is they who organized the three continental conference in Havana in 1966 with the host of Fidel Castro. So the Belgrade and Havana is the continuity of the Bandung conference. So I show here just some picture. First, Fidel Castro as a host. And then uh, Allende, one of the uh, important speaker and participant who, who became later president of Chile. And then, of course, uh, from uh, Cap Verde, uh, Amilcar Cabral, one of the star of the conference and of course Ben Barca who is the organizer but who was kidnapped in Paris and 
we don't know until now what really happened with him. He disappeared. So, I would like to announce that this year, in October, we will commemorate this three conferences. 66 years of Bandung, 60 years of Belgrade, and 55 years of Havana. So, it is magic number. 66, 60, and 55. If you believe in metaphysics, maybe it is interesting. Now, Let's go further. So, uh, you will see the pictures. But, Sukarno's role in Belgrade conference, I can divide into three. The pre-conference, the conference, and post-conference. In the pre-conference, pre-conference, from 1965 until 1961, it is what I call network building. As I wrote in my uh, abstract, Sukarno represent a, a manifestation of Indonesia, natural manifestation of Indonesia. Indonesia is an archipelago of 17,000 islands, more than 500 ethnic groups, languages, religions, and be, uh, situated between two civilizational entities, China and India. So Indonesia is naturally mediator between India and China and a globally become a mediator of the global powers. So Sukarno represent perfectly this. He is network Builders from 1955 until 1961, Sukarno uh, made a big tours of the world in Asia, in Africa, and Europe, in America. Every time he make a campaign on first the Indonesia and Pancasila, as I mentioned, the philosophy of uh, ideological foundation of Indonesia. The second, the foreign policy of Indonesia, which is independent and active at the same time, non aligned to any power blocks. And the third, the Bandung spirit. Sukarno promoted the Bandung spirit and especially Asia African movement. And then, fifth, the need to organize a conference, non-aligned countries. So Sukarno already made a campaign of this since 1956, uh, when he made a tour in Asia, Africa, Europe, America, until 1960. So uh, I will show you some picture after. And then during the conference, uh, we we'll, we read carefully the final declaration of the conference, we will see the trace of Sukarno, which he formulated as Old Defo and Nefo. Old Defo say old established forces, and Nefo is new emerging forces. As he mentioned, as he made speeches on this issue, and he, of course, uh, pushed to include in Belgrade final declaration, it is clear that the world is marked by these two forces. That is a uh, contribution, very important contribution of Sukarno. And uh, yes, and Sukarno is the, the first head of state who formulated the term emergence, emerging. Now it is used by the capitalists as emerging markets, etc., etc. Uh, and then the second is the strong point of decolonization. This is Sukarno, uh, Sukarno's soul since he was very young. Decolonization. But also in his speech in Belgrade, he also said that after decolonization, what we should do, it is emancipation, uh, development. That is the 
three points of contribution of Sukarno in the Belgrade uh, Declaration. Now, post-conference, 1961 until 1965, Sukarno's idea of NEFO, new emerging forces, he tried to put into concrete reality of the forces of new emerging forces. Who is the new emerging forces in the conception of Sukarno? New emerging forces are the people of Asia, Africa, Latin America, and all the people of the North who has a progressive uh, thinking and in, in support of the socialism, uh, of socialist uh, philosophy. And then he organized this. Uh, he organized CONEFO. He projected a, a, a CONEFO, Conference of New Emerging Forces, because he criticized a lot UN, which is based in New York, which is in the hand or uh, under the control of the United States of America. So he proposed to set up the con Conference of New Emerging Forces. And he organized GANEFO, Games of the New Emerging Forces, as because he criticized the Olympic Games as dominated or tools of imperialist uh, domination. So he created GANEFO, Games of the New Emerging Forces, etc. And then he made a conf confrontation with Malaysia and Singapore because uh, the foundation of Malaysia uh, with the uh, attachment of North Borneo into Malaya uh, Peninsula uh, in the eyes of Sukarno, it is imperialist project of UK. So he against the, the, the association, the, the creation of Federation of Malaysia. So it makes a confrontation between Indonesia and Malaysia until the fall of Sukarno. And then what is the radical, the most radical measure led by Sukarno is exit, getting out from UN uh, in 1965 or 64, 55. Uh, and Indonesia was out of UN until the fall of Sukarno. So this is more or less the, uh, my idea that I will develop into article uh, for our project book that will be published uh, in our next conference in Indonesia in October. So I will show uh, some picture of uh, Sukarno. So uh, you see here in Asia, Sukarno with Mao Zedong, Sukarno with Nehru, Sukarno with Ho Chi Minh, Sukarno with uh, uh, Hirohito. Uh, and what we see here, Sukarno is always somebody who is smiling, he is charming, uh, and he is uh, very easy with people. Uh, so it's, it's a natural, natural position of him as mediator, as a, a, a network. Well, my, in my my summary, Sukarno is a, a mediator and a network builder and a solidarity maker. So you see Sukarno with Tito. Uh, I don't know what they drink, uh, but Sukarno does not drink alcohol. So I, I think uh, Tito maybe drink wine and Sukarno orange juice. I don't know. We, we don't know exactly. And you see here Sukarno with Khrushchev, uh, with smiles, joking. Uh, and and Sukarno, Tito, when he visited Indonesia with his wife, uh, here you see the picture. And this is in United States, Sukarno with Eisenhower, to always smiling although they are opposing each other. And also Sukarno with Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson in uh, Washington. And in Paris, Sukarno met De Gaulle twice to talk about independence of Algeria and the need of UN reform. So it is interesting that uh, 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 Sukarno met De Gaulle twice in, in Paris. Uh, in Paris. And now uh, you see how easy Sukarno to get socialized with people. Uh, the first picture you see Sukarno with the wife 
of uh, President Eisenhower. And the second, you suka no dancing with uh, uh, Madam Howard Jones, the ambassador of United States in Jakarta. And the third, you see Sukarno with the wife of Richard Nixon. So you see the Sukarno is, is, is very flexible, charming, smiling, and always joking people, but deep and, uh, and very uh, harsh when he speak about colonialism, domination, hegemony, etc. Now, Sukarno met everybody, uh, the people, and every time he visited a country, become an event. Uh, and it was published largely in newspapers. And even in Belgrade, one of the documents that I studied, when Sukarno visited Belgrade, all the schools are uh, free. Uh, they are liberated from courses to, to welcome Sukarno. And Sukarno even met with artists. You see here Sukarno with Marilyn Monroe when he visited United States of America. So it is uh, just to show <laughs> the multi-dimensional dimensional, uh, personality and complex personality of Sukarno. Now, Sukarno in Latin America, especially uh, in uh, Cuba, but Sukarno also visiting Argentina, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, uh, Uruguay, uh, and one of the most interesting anecdote, when Sukarno visited Sao Paulo in Brazil, there is a group of people welcoming him in the name, under the name of uh, Arab community of Sao Paulo, telling welcome President Sukarno, the representative of Arab world where Sukarno is not from the Arab world, but it, it, uh, it shows how uh, it is uh, still uh, misunderstood at the time that uh, Sukarno was considered as well as the leader of Arab world. Uh, and with uh, Castro, even uh, Cuba uh, uh, published uh, a stem, uh, Sukarno and Castro, and Sukarno and Che Guevara. So you see here the picture of Sukarno with Castro, with the president Dorticos from Cuba. Here you see Sukarno with Dorticos, with uh, Castro, and here also uh, Che Guevara in Cuba. Now, this is what is famous picture of the five leaders of non-alignment. When they met in September, 1960, so one year before the Belgrade conference, they met in uh, UN and they decided to organize something uh, big of non-alignment. And uh, that is why uh, it's famous of initiative of five. Now Sukarno with uh, Nasser and Nehru, Sukarno with Nkrumah, Sukarno with the Cho Enlai, and this is the atmosphere of uh, uh, the Belgrade Conference. And you see here Haile Selassie, uh, uh, Nasser, uh, and then Tito, Sukarno, Nehru. You see here all the representatives of 25 countries, including only one lady, one woman, uh, Siri Mavo Bandara Naik, uh, as representative of uh, Sri Lanka. You see here uh, Sukarno in the Belgrade conference. And yeah. the decision of the conference, they designate, designated Sukarno and Modibo Keita as emissary delegate of the Belgrade conference to deliver by hand the message of the Belgrade Conference to President Kennedy in Washington, in one hand. On the other hand, they designated Nehru and Krumah to deliver the same message to Khrushchev in Moscow. So this is the picture of Sukarno, Kennedy, and Krumah during 
their mission of the Belgrade conference. So I think I would like to end my presentation here. Uh, I hope it is useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a very, very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now I will invite our colleague friend from Serbia, Jovan Kavoski. I will read first your small short biography. Okay. Okay. Can so, you hear me? I will. Jovan Kavoski is research research fellow at the Institute for Recent History of Serbia. After completing his undergraduate and MPhil studies at the Belgrade University History Department in 2014, he completed his PhD in Diplomacy, Diplomatic History at the Peking University School of International Studies and his thesis, written and defended in Chinese, deals with China's policies toward rising strategy of non-alignment in the 1950s and 1960s. His research focuses on the Cold War and in the Third World, especially on the comparative Chinese, Yugoslav, India, Myanmar, Indonesia, North Korean foreign policies toward that region. Also analyzing superpower influences, as well as following the rise and evolution of the concept of neutralism and non-alignment in world affairs. He took active part in many international conferences in Serbia, China, the US, Canada, Russia, India, Germany, Portugal, Italy, Algeria, etc. While he was a visiting fellow and also conducted intensive archival and library research in different scientific institutions in Serbia, China, and the US, Russia, Cuba, Myanmar, India, etc. More than 40 of his articles, book chapters, and working papers, as well as one of book were published or are in the process of publication in leading journals and volumes in Serbia, China, India, Russia, Britain, Germany, Indonesia, Myanmar, and the United States. No, now, Jovan, it's your turn. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, Darius, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this wonderful conference. And uh, I will use my time to talk about the uh, Tito's role in the origins of the Initiative 5 and Tito's uh, brand of non-alignment in the, in the 50s and, and uh, 1950s and 1960s. So contrary to our general comprehension, Historically speaking, uh, non-alignment was never a concept that was exclusively applied to the policies of the third world states, even though its conceptual origins can be largely associated with that part of the world. In fact, socialist Yugoslavia had a formative influence on the character of non-alignment from the early 1950s, and it had played a very influential role in its gradual institutionalization into a fully fledged international movement. Unlike many Asian or African online countries, Yugoslavia's non-alignment, however, was not the logical result of any anti-colonial struggle, but a direct outcome of the inter-bloc policy dynamics of the Cold War, when Belgrade, a former Soviet bloc member, decided to adopt an independent, realist, active, and flexible approach to world affairs. This implied that Yugoslavia decided to hold high the founding principles of the United Nations as a guarantee of independence for small nations and the shield against interference of great powers into their internal affairs. Active cooperation with all international actors based on these widely accepted principles of independence and mutual respect, no matter the size of the country, firm rejection of all bloc divisions, as well as continuous struggle for the world of free and equal nations have also become the highlight of Yugoslavia's foreign policy engagement during those decades. Essentially, the strength of Yugoslavia's appeal among non-aligned countries stemmed from the fact that it was a small country that provided somewhat of a role model to other developing countries in the field of modernization economic development, indicating how one could actively receive aid from both blocs while simultaneously extending its own aid to other non-aligned countries, thus, somewhat minimizing their involvement with these same blocks. 
This kind of approach largely contributed to the considerable influence Yugoslavia's President Josip Broz Tito enjoyed among other non-line leaders, while his country as a European state was highly regarded throughout Asia, Africa, and Latin America as a genuine adherent and proponent of non-alignment. According to Tito, the essence of non-alignment was marked by the continuous struggle against the conditions that bred war, those were block politics, spheres of influence, arms race, etc., thus securing international peace and stability. In short, Yugoslavia sought a reduction of Cold War rivalries and the broadening of the political base of non-alignment by encompassing a growing number of newly independent countries and other proponents of non-bloc association, thus enhancing the wider international solidarity of different independent factors against the general setting of the Cold War. This was the basis for Tito's universal approach to non-alignment, one which went far beyond any regional, racial, historical, or socio-political constraints. In addition, Yugoslavia was also one of the first non-Asian countries that adopted the five principles of peaceful co coexistence, Panchil, not only as means to boost its prestige as a country pursuing an independent foreign policy, but also to further recalibrate its position in world affairs. Therefore, Tito started promoting his own brand of peaceful coexistence, officially dubbed as active peaceful coexistence, which demonstrated respect for one country's internal development, its sovereignty and territorial integrity, but it also dealt with the various causes of tensions in the world. According to Tito, this kind of active cooperation between all countries, both bloc ones and non-bloc ones, should be primarily based on the principles of mutual equality and mutual understanding, non-interference, since these were crucial preconditions for achieving any success in such interactions. The immediate outcome of all these efforts, as viewed by Tito, should be gradual elimination of all international divisions, which bred political, economic, social, and other causes of war. Essentially, this concept was the basic negation of the divisive Cold War politics, observing peaceful coexistence much wider than just the two blocks, two socio-political systems, or individual states, while concurrently considering the two blocks as the principal obstacle to the worldwide promotion of peace, stability, and cooperation. The 1955 Asian African Conference in Bandung ushered in an era of third world cemetery. This was the first time when the leaders of formerly colonized nations demonstrated that their outright ability to seriously deliberate international problems and offer their own solutions for them. These states strongly voiced their demands for total decolonization, racial and national equality, while actively promoting economic and cultural cooperation among them, thus politically galvanizing the entire post-colonial world. However, factors as a poorly defined ge geographical framework of this conference and regional isolationism, equal representation of both aligned and bloc countries, the lack of any coherent principles, except the most general ones, which Darvis mentioned, uh, uh, that could ultimately bridge the gap among these essentially different participants, so bloc and non-bloc members, somewhat limited the worldwide impact of this meeting. In fact, regional exclusiveness of the Bandung model signaled to the Yugoslav leadership that the non-aligned world should be brought together over much more concrete issues and principles than just geographical representation or shared colonial traumas. Struggle for peace and stability against all tensions and many conflicts, promotion of mutual cooperation and development were laudable efforts, which demanded putting together a much broader international coalition going beyond just the number of countries in Asia and Africa. As seen by Tito and his associates, the general concept of non-alignment largely surpassed the narrow geographical divisions of these two continents, and it held some very universal ideas and principles, irrespective of many local and regional constraints. However, being exposed to constant pressure exercised by both blocs, while in the late 1950s and early 1960s the Cold War was also getting into another phase of hot confrontation, 
Tito did nurture the idea of finally organizing a conference of all truly non-line nations from all continents that could then deal with the pressing issues of nuclear disarmament, east-west relations, lessening of international tensions, economic development, and similar. On the other hand, Tito never nurtured the idea of setting up another block of neutralist countries, since this would not only face strong opposition from Nehru and Nasser, but it would also be contrary to the basic tenets of non-alignment. This kind of tense international situation triggered different demands for organizing a concerted action of leading non-line countries, while the forthcoming 15th United Nations General Assembly session in September 1960 seemed as the right place for all these nations to publicly state their claims and make their demands heard in all major world capitals. The sheer fact that Cyprus and 16 Western Central African nations gained their independence that same year seemed as an auspicious sign that a number of non-bloc nations has been, had been on the rise, thus putting additional weight behind such political initiatives. Since the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev was actively lobbying for his Troika proposal for UN reform, he also wanted to solicit support from the leaders like Nehru, Nasser, and Sukarno. But he was not glad that Tito would be also present in New York, particularly in the light of his ideological conflict with Yugoslavia. For the same reasons, the Chinese side was also unhappy that Tito would be there, since, in their mind, he could exercise harmful influence on different Asian and African leaders that personally trusted him, and then they would go along with his plans for organizing an online and not an Afro-Asian conference. Therefore, while facing such a mounting challenge long by the two blocs, both Tito and Nasser decided to closely coordinate their activities at this session of the United Nations General Assembly, particularly when it came to the debate on the issues of ending colonialism, particularly in Congo, and setting up a working mechanism for global disarmament talks. The two leaders had also reached a consensus that the Soviet UN reform proposal should be rejected without any consideration. Basically speaking, Yugoslavia stood firmly behind any initiatives launched by a number of non-line nations in order to assist in set setting off a new round of a constructive dialogue between the superpowers, which could eventually diffuse world tensions. Since Nehru was still having his reservations about any joint non-aligned actions in the UN, Tito, strongly backed by Nasser, made the decision to act in coordinated fashion with Sukarno and Nkrumah as the driving force behind this new initiative of, in Tito's words, putting down this conflagration between Washington and Moscow. All preliminary documents were largely drafted by the Yugoslav and Egyptian diplomats, continuously accompanied by their uh, Indonesian and Ghanaian colleagues. Still, the gravity of the international situation ultimately compelled leaders of all five non-line countries, now India included, to close in their ranks and act in a concerted manner when form formulating and submitting this joint appeal as a new resolution for a new round of the superpower dialogue. This decision was made during the meeting of the five leaders on the 29th of September inside the premises of the Yugoslav UN mission. So this was the famous initiative of the five. During Tito's earlier meeting with the United States President Eisenhower, it seemed that the Americans would endorse any non-aligned mediation, since in the words of the United States President, quote, non-bloc countries could exercise a positive role in today's situation, end quote. However, as means to avoid any international criticism of being uncooperative, but still not being quite keen on endorsing non-aligned proposals, the United States and British diplomats decided to render this joint initiative largely ineffective by submitting a number of amendments to its text which aimed at watering down its contents, blunting its edge, thus compelling these five non-line leaders to eventually withdraw their proposed text of the resolution. In spite of the fact that this proposal received the majority of votes in the, uh, in the General Assembly, so 49 votes for, 37 against, and 17 abstentions, that was still not enough to proceed with this mediation effort since both blocs were clearly reluctant to back it or accept any of its recommendations afterwards. This state of affairs clearly demonstrated that there was no point of insist in, uh, or insisting on such mediation, which could not be henceforth implemented. Nevertheless, this was still a significant moral and political victory for these non-bloc countries, 
since both sides of the Cold War were now compelled to listen to their grievances and seriously take into consideration their objections, if not now, then in the near future. Essentially, this entire endeavor in the United Nations clearly demonstrated that the majority of non-aligned nations were quite capable of assuming role of responsible global mediators in the matters of peace and security, thus inciting some of them to start seriously contemplating the, um, that international conditions for convening a new conference on online nations were already ripe enough. In one of his statements made in New York, Tito then said, quote, I remain convinced that at this General Assembly, non-aligned forces are becoming more numerous, unified, and aware of the dangers threatening mankind. They have become a factor great powers must take into account, end quote. This clearly indicated that the destiny of the mankind, as Tito saw it, should not be just left in the hands of a few great powers, but it should become a collective responsibility of all countries in the world. In fact, Tito personally experienced in New York that there was still enough political potential and goodwill among so many different non-aligned countries to forge an extensive political front with respect to some of the crucial international issues, making their voice heard worldwide and strongly stating their claims in front of the world public opinion. These latest developments also served as an inspiration for Tito to set off an, on a prolonged journey to West and North Africa in early 1961, when he managed to win support from a number of prominent, uh, prominent African and Arab leaders for convening an online summit in September, right on the eve of the 16th United uh, Nations General Assembly session where all these representatives could then freely discuss any substantial international issues like the preservation of peace ending colonialism, disarmament, nuclear test ban, new international role of the United Nations, etc. Afterwards, as envisaged by Tito, this joint stance could be afterwards presented to both superpowers as a uni unified resolution, a clear voice of one third of humanity, not just of five non-aligned countries as it had been the case in 1960. This was considered as the last stand attempt by the consciousness of the mankind, as Tito dubbed the non-aligned, to break the dangerous deadlock which had engulfed the international organization, thus bringing back sinister memories of pre-Second World War events. The overwhelming presence of these nations at the summit and inside the United Nations fora, almost half of all United Nations membership, could have ultimately provided Tito and his allies with a serious political leverage in this respect. Therefore, events in New York served as a serious stimulus for Tito, Nasser, Nehru, Sukarno, Nkrumah, and others to make one final push and have a formal online summit in Belgrade in, in September 1961, thus officially launching the history of the non-line movement. As one a Western author wisely concluded, I quote, Tito's ideas fell on receptive ears, he struck the right note, with the right audience at the right moment in time. Thank you. Now, uh, Mohammed El Shim is uh, not there, I suppose. So, luckily, we have still 20, how much? 23 minutes <laughs> to go to 12 o'clock to go to break, lunch break. Uh, so, Christina, are you still available? So I leave to Christina to manage uh, mm -hmm. if uh, there is a question and uh, answers, uh, etc. So anybody to wants mm -hmm. to, I, I don't know how, how to, uh, what is the way I did nothing, what is the but way to, to ask to speak. So um, so can I just suggest to everyone if you have questions or, or comments, uh, if you click on the um, the button right at the bottom, there is reaction. You may raise your hand just like this. You see where my photo is and then you have a hand that's raised, uh, right? You see that? So you can um, you can raise your hand and or lower your hand if you wish to ask questions or just to intervene. Uh, all right. Is that all right? Yes. So I see that we already have uh, one participant who uh, 
uh, Devon, I, I suppose, yes? Yeah, I'm just curious if there's anyone here from Egypt, it would be nice to hear from them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Something on Nasser. Yeah, it would have been an uh, idea. So uh, anyone has any input concerning, concerning that question? Or perhaps uh, reactions from uh, some of our speakers? Amzat, maybe you can speak a little bit about Nasser. Unfortunately, our friend Muhammad El Shim from Egypt yeah, does uh, not show up. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a specialist of Nasser, but um, what I because could... uh, you know that uh, 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 Kruma get mm. get got married with Egyptian, <laughs> thanks to this. <laughs> This conference, uh, Cairo conference, Bandung conference, non-aligned moon movement conference. Yeah, I think there is the issue of pan-Africanism and pan-Arabism that is really important, that was very relevant at, at those times. And uh, both those two movements were uh, tackling the idea of the European nation states. I think that the alliance between uh, Nasser and Kuma was really interesting, but it did not really work uh, uh -huh. because um, they had two different visions of uh, African unity. And uh, I think that the Bandung movement and the non-aligned movement uh, could have been a very interesting platform for both of them. But unfortunately, like Sukarno, uh, both of them were uh, defeated. Uh, Kuma was overthrown in 1966 and uh, Nasser lost uh, the war in the next year and died in 1970. So I think that what we should um, discuss is the legacy of both Kuma and Nasser in the context of the 70s. Uh, mm -hmm. Because what they implemented was really interesting, but it seems like it only lasted for 10, 15 years. And we should um, have a look at the imperialist forces. We should have a look at the reactionary and conservative forces in Ghana and in Egypt, and how they try to manage in the non-aligned movement with an internal opposition, both in Ghana and in Egypt. I think that it is a very important issue to understand that foreign policy is not, um, uh, is not to be um, isolated from uh, domestic policy. In the case of Kuma, it is really important because his vision of Pan-Africanism, his non-aligned policy was contested inside uh, by a nationalist movement, by xenophobic movement. And uh, the way he got married with an, Egypt an Egyptian woman uh, was lots of debates, uh, even in Ghana. So uh, this issue could be, I think, really uh, important. And the other one is the historical issue, the fact that Accra and Cairo is for the African liberation movements. Uh, movements from Cameroon with uh, Union des Populations du Cameroon, uh, the connection with uh, Amilcar Cabral and the Guinean Liberation Movement with Algeria, and the battle between uh, Kuma and, and Nasser, uh, I think, pushed Nasser to, um, to, uh, to, in, to get involved more in the non-aligned movement than Kuma did because Kuma took the control of the continental project of the United States of Africa. And Accra became the capital of this movement. That is why in 1958, we have those two conferences in Accra and not in Cairo. So I think that the connection between Pan-Africanism, Pan-Arabism need to be discussed uh, clearly and also the internal division and the internal contestation of those two leaders in their own countries to understand what is their legacy today. This is a few indications I could, that I could give to the, to the debate. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, so yes, uh, it seems like uh, Truman, you wanted to, um, you also had some uh, input on that? Uh, no, no, no. I, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. I mean, um, we don't have time for, for a detailed uh, elaboration. Nasser, I did a lot of research, both in archives in Yugoslavia and in India on the trilateral relationship between the three leaders and everything. So I wrote to everyone in, in the chat, there is a, a mm. book chapter I wrote, uh, it was published in the United States, it's called Constructing Nasser's Neutralism. It's based mm. on the archives in Yugoslavia, India, China, United States, etc. And it discusses this formative influences of Yugoslavia, India and others on uh, mm. Nasser's choice of uh, neutrality and non-alignment in the early 1950s. So I think it will be interesting for everyone to read it. Mm -hmm. Of uh, course, if you choose. <laughs> uh, uh, another point very interesting to know is that uh, Egypt was not invited to uh, the celebration of Ghana independence. Yeah. Not uh -huh. because Kuma uh -huh. and Nasser were not close, they were really allied, but um, the invitations were sent by the British colonial office and they really did not want uh, to uh, to get Nasser in contact with uh, with Kuma. In their vision, Ghana was a very good independence. Kuma was a very good guy that would remain in the British and Western camp. And Nasser was like the devil. And this is something that you need to know. Egypt was not invited. Uh, Soviet Union was there with a small delegation with uh, the Ministry of South Coast and uh, Egypt was not allowed to, to, um, to be in, in Accra, also because there was a diplomatic break between uh, Cairo and London at, uh, at that time. Thank you so much for that. Now, uh, any further thoughts, questions from, the, uh, from other members of the audience? Yes, I see some, yes. Okay. And I have a question to all the speakers, whether they encourage the role of women in public sphere, all these leaders of non-alignment movement. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. So uh, oh, is there anyone who would like to begin the discussion concerning the role of women? Well, I can say some words that, uh, <laughs> as I sh showed in the picture mm -hmm. uh, of the assembly of the representative of the uh, non-aligned countries, it is only one woman uh, represented, uh, which is by Siri Mavo Bandaranaike from uh, uh, Prime Minister of Sri Lanka at that time. The others are fully men, <laughs> uh, but it is, I think... Uh, oh, there will be Indira Gandhi later. Yeah, mm. Indira Gandhi, uh, but <laughs> From it, after, even in, when in Bandung conference, Indira Gandhi was there, but uh, not representing India. It was his father, uh, mm. her father. So even in Bandung, there are only fully men. There is no even lady. So uh, Belgrade is a progress with one woman mm. <laughs> among the 25 uh, uh, country members. And then but there's I even think more progress. It's a, then part, you have two women. it's a part <laughs> of global structure of patriarchy. Uh, so it is unavoidable. I mean, it is the... Yeah, the time. It, it, it was the, the time when until mm -hmm. until now, it's still, uh, uh, we are still under, I think, uh, patriarchy uh, in, in everywhere. The structure, political structure, still less women than men. Uh, even in Western countries, the salary of women are less than men, for example, uh, until now. And also the structure of uh, 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 of uh, government, uh, also uh, less women than men. So I think, well, it is a part, it must be a part of the struggle of the women's uh, movement uh, and uh, in, um, to, to, 
to uh, uh, come okay. out uh, or to how to to settle this 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 problem but in terms of declaration uh, either in Bandung or in in Belgrade uh, the uh, the equality was stressed but at that time it's mostly political equality I mean the equality of races and nations but not the equality of gender for example <laughs> so this is but we can that's why I, I propose in the core values of Bandung the equality of races and nation must be extended also the equality of gender uh, included uh, mm -hmm. so that's uh, what uh, so uh, well in yeah. our conference this time mm -hmm. we have five sessions successive sessions dedicated to gender and women issues but the large majority of speakers are women <laughs> With the very dense. Akhil, Akhil has a question. Just a point, uh, you know, regarding the question raised by Professor Mitut Mohanty. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we need to look at the way the movement was, anti-colonial movements were built up. If you look at India's uh, struggle for independence, even if it didn't really talk in terms of uh, equality and gender, but the issue of equality was very strong. Look at the Karachi Resolution uh, in 1930 itself. Uh, in, it talked about universal suffrage. Most, and uh, India was, uh, you know, 17 years ahead of its, I uh, know, 70 years before India had achieved independence. It talked about universal suffrage. Uh, you know, but most of the European countries, countries like even Switzerland, had to wait till 1960s to give a uh, you know, right to vote to women. Uh, therefore, even if the gender equality was not a core issue, but equality across class, caste, gender was very, very vital in the anti-colonial struggle. And that has helped most of the third world countries, particularly India to build up the kind of women movements or uh, the gender movements which are consolidating day by day and linking it uh, with the larger political issues, larger, uh, you know, larger economic issues, uh, particularly the ecological issues and livelihood issues. I think we, we really do not, uh, we cannot generalize whether it was gender based, it talked about gender equality, but if we look at as a process, gender was a core issue, a critical issue there. Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you for that input. Uh, reactions, uh, see someone in the chat. Uh, yeah, I saw uh, Professor Buhanti raise hand. Ah, uh, yes. I have Please. a, I have a, question uh, which I think all of us should uh, take up. It has come up um, and I, I particularly like uh, uh, Jovan and Darvis, also Amja, to respond to this uh, about UN, uh, non-aligned movement uh, attitude towards UN. Uh, I think in the 60s, that was a time when uh, they found UN playing uh, some positive role. Uh, despite the fact that the, you know, the structure was unequal and the five powers uh, and, you know, China was still not, uh, People's China was not uh, seated there. Uh, and, uh, but then um, Sukarno also found it not adequate and wanted uh, an alternative uh, global organization. Uh, uh, I think Nehru uh, and Tito were, you know, they seem to be very uh, committed to UN and used the UN forum uh, because its charter and the NAM uh, charter and the Bandung charter, you know, they were, they had many things about uh, independence, equality of nations and so on as common. Uh, so, um, and uh, Nkrumah was in between, you know, sometimes enthusiastic, uh, but I think most of the time critical. Uh, so, uh, and uh, then you find uh, in the 70s comes a time after China joins and many other countries become independent. Uh, they, uh, I mean, there is a third world majority in the 
General Assembly, which then the Americans and the British react to. And from uh, then on, they begin to marginalize the UN. So uh, in retrospect, how would you see, and this is the 75th anniversary of the founding of the UN uh, and uh, the SDG goals for 2030 uh, are uh, talked about quite, quite a lot. How do you see in retrospect, uh, uh, you know, our leaders uh, handled this institution, the global institution, the UN, uh, and uh, in what ways they are, they were correct, in what ways we have to look afresh. Reactions? Responses? Anybody? Yeah, who would like to go first? Joven or... Uh, Oh, Darvis or whoever. Oh, Darvis. Okay, Darvis. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, I think, well, I think uh, non-aligned move movement is always diverse. Huh? Mm. Contrary to Western world, which is united by a system, which is capitalism. Outside Western world, the economical, social, political systems are diverse. So there is no unity in term of uh, uh, in term of uh, uh, political uh, decision, uh, etc. Uh, so it depends also. In this case, every country has his trajectory, his trends. For example, India today is the uh, foreign policy or not only foreign policy but uh, internal policy is is completely opposed or different from the the, the previous one uh, india well only the country with one system china which has uh, can maintain the same the trajectory the same policy for long term but the democratic countries like India, Indonesia, uh, and also uh, other countries of Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, the, with the democracy, it is very fragile. The the, uh, the 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 situation, the decision can change. Uh, Brazil, for example, is a very interesting example from Lula to Bolsonaro. Uh, so uh, I think. Well, the question is then, what democracy uh, we should develop? Uh, that's, uh, I think it's uh, very important. As for Indonesia, I think it's in a good, in a good uh, uh, position in terms of uh, uh, politics. I mean, the, 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 uh, the respect to the constitution, which is, well, I, I didn't mention very important two points of the constitutions, as uh, uh, Professor Mohanty mentioned, first, in Indonesia has uh, uh, maintained uh, its its uh, uh, anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist in the constitutions. That uh, this is the first that all the colonialism, imperialism is uh, to be eradicated from the world. That is one of the point in the con Indonesian constitution, and the second. Indonesia should participate to maintain peace and justice in the world. This is a, a, a Indonesian constitution. And this, uh, the, the, gov uh, the, the present government is in, on the right track. Although there is, of course, uh, weak points, uh, strong point, but the outline is, is, uh, is in the track of the constitution and uh, the the the, uh, the uh, how do you say the faithful toward the Bandung spirit and non-aligned movement, but we don't know in the next in the yeah. next government we don't know. Yeah. Um, right. Yes. Let's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Th th this is a very important question uh, indeed, uh, because I think that the role of the United Nations in the world, particularly in the 
three, four decades after the end of the Second World War and the rise of non-alignment and the non-aligned movement after it are closely interconnected. Because uh, non-alignment uh, and non-aligned movement in itself was a multilateral mechanism of presenting the opinions, grievances, uh, suggestions of the majority of, of, of the world to the uh, to the blocks, to the great powers, and everything else. So there is a, a connection between, if you can see, for example, 1960s, 1970s, even 1980s, the major events in the United Nations are closely intertwined with the major events in the non-line movement. For example, I will also be, uh, accept, for example, the annual meetings of the United Nations General Assembly, with, where most of the most important suggestions of the non-aligned were presented to the great powers and to the world public opinion. For example, one of the most important initiatives, uh, which unfortunately failed in, by the end of the 1970s, was in, uh, the, 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 uh, the idea of the new international economic order which was presented in 1970, already at the Algiers conference in a way in 1973, but also in 74 at the special session of the United Nations. So this was the only way. I know uh, the United Nations have never been perfect. Particularly they haven't been perfect since, uh, since the end of the Cold War because in a way they have been dismantled um, uh, essentially, if not formally, by different actions of different great powers, mostly Western ones uh, for, since that time. But at the same time, it has remained the only big platform, the space, the stage for the developing nations, the non-aligned nations, small nations, to equally, at least formally on equal footing, speak with the great powers, present their grief, grievances and everything else. I think the key, until, if there is another international organization in the world, maybe it would be better for the developing world. But at the, at the moment, and in the past 70 years, we have had only the United Nations. So we have to, unfortunately or fortunately, stick to it and start to push certain agendas which tackle the, the basic problems of the two thirds of mankind through th these forums, even if they fail, the, all the online nations, developing nations should continue pushing through their own agenda. And I think it's very important to maintain what the online movement had established uh, during the Cold War, is this strong connection between the activities of online developing countries and the UN, increase collective activities inside the UN and outside the UN. I think that's very important. Mm. And still through this collective mechanism, start to continue pushing this agenda and also talking to the great powers. What Tito really understood, uh, particularly when I read his papers and everything else, uh, where his internal thoughts about many international issues and why he disagreed in the end with Sukarno, and that was the end in a way of their friendship after the Cairo conference of 64, is the, Donald, the, the great powers, the superpowers, they are not good. They are not your true friends but you cannot function outside them. So you have to work in some way with them. You don't have to succumb to their pressure. You don't have to become an ally or, 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 or a slave of any block or great power, but you have to have a dialogue because without that dialogue, it's the most, and I think what is the most important agenda still, which non-alignment holds high in the past and today is um, two issues, international security, and economic development. So these are two, decolonization, economic development is also connected with the issues we mentioned here, like neocolonialism, et cetera, et cetera. But economic development, because without economic development, there is no future for the, for the developing world. We can see with the, with the rise of Asia. Asia has managed now to dictate its own, inside the international system, but it has started to dictate its own terms to the, to the rest of the international system in a way, or at least through dialogue to make them come halfway to their, uh, towards their own uh, agenda. So uh, now still Africa needs to rise, uh, Latin America parts of Europe, Eastern Europe is also uh, part of, 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 let's say lesser under development, but still slowly developing. So I think these are some of the issues where United Nations have to remain the key uh, arena for presenting collective ideas, grievances, etc., of the developing world towards the great powers and to insist on a dialogue, even if it fails in the first stage, maybe in the future, it would, it would uh, succeed. And each and every uh, developing country, I, uh, to my opinion, should strive to uh, build up its own forces because only more prosperous nations 
uh, in Asia, Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, etc., can really have a serious dialogue with the great powers. Thank you. Excuse me, sorry to interrupt. I, I have to leave now because my I have a class that just started uh, three minutes. Okay, Christina, so I, I take over. Yeah. Thank you. See you. So, well, according to time frame, it is uh, 12 o'clock past three minutes. But if you still, well, uh, you can resist against your hunger because uh, we are supposed to go to lunch break. It doesn't matter if you can still stay. If you have any comments, uh, well, I see Beatrice raising hand. Okay, Beatrice. Beatrice Bisio. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, I can't uh, put my camera on. I, I don't know. Um, okay, but I, a short comment. I think that it's important to realize how pioneering were the non-aligned uh, and always uh, also also Bandung conference on saying that the underdevelopment of third world was not a, a step. Uh, there was no possibility of having a step through development for third world countries unless the whole chain, the whole system changes. Nowadays, we have this very, very clearly. The whole system has to change in if we are willing or we desire to change the destiny of the underdeveloped, the periphery. But I think it's very important to, to, to realize how uh, uh, 60 years ago, they have this very, very clearly in their minds and they put this new order as a global new order. You think that's a debate we have still to date, uh, till today, uh, which ways we can, we can uh, have through development. And I think they have the key, they put the key years ago, 60 years ago to think globally, the, 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 uh, oh, now I can. To yeah. think globally the destiny of, of, of mankind is not, uh, uh, possible to, to think uh, development as a step starting from the same um, the, the same situation or uh, trajectory of colonialism and imperialism. So uh, perhaps we, we this is a matter I have been thinking how pi pioneering was that idea. And nowadays in, in this globalized uh, world and more globalized through this pandemic, we, we now see, realize how uh, global we are as humans, uh, glo uh, mankind. Uh, this this uh, re way of reasoning, I think it was very, very important to, to, to understand that. That's my comment, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Beatrice is in Rio de Janeiro. At what time you yeah. are? Eight o'clock in the morning now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will take my breakfast and you will take your lunch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so any other? Yes, uh, Akil. Yeah, uh, I'll make it short and precise. Uh, Mohanty, sir, Professor Mohanty raised a very pertinent question regarding the position that uh, the non-aligned leaders took in the UN, how do we assess it? So my understanding is this, that even if the neoliberalism has come, the global hegemonic forces have uh, you know, consolidated themselves, but the position taken by the non-aligned leaders in the UN continues, its legacy continues, because along with the hegemony, the struggle for anti-hegemony or counter-hegemony or the struggle for uh, equitable uh, society based on justice is very, very strong. And that is why we are here today. Otherwise, probably we wouldn't have been in a position. Look at 1960s. Now, uh, the two uh, most important covenants. You know, had the uh, non-alignment movement or non-aligned leaders not been there, and particularly the leaders from the African continent, uh, was it uh, had it been possible to adopt uh, both the international covenant on uh, civil and political rights and also uh, international covenant on uh, uh, social, economic, and cultural rights? Even if the global hegemony 
uh, hegemonic forces have become strong, but they have not been in a position to delegitimize it. And the election, uh, the uh, 2020, 21 election, uh, 20 elections, the United States had proven it. You know, even in the developed countries, countries like United States of America, you know, those, uh, you know, legacies are, have been working very strongly. And the sustainable development goals for that better millennium development goals or for that better UN human development uh, reports, which has now been extended to social development reports by people like Professor Manoranjan Mohanty. And for that matter, you know, development as freedom, uh, the notion given by uh, Professor Amartya Sen and others have direct or indirect linkages to the non-alignment movement. I think uh, that legacy proves that uh, these leaders had played a very, very historic role, constructive role, and at their point, they were very, very correct in upholding their own positions. Okay, any thank question, you. any comment? I think we should conclude this session now. Huh? Okay. So there is no conclusion. This is... Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what I feel is that, uh, in fact, the four speakers of us uh, has the same line, uh, the same general outline, the same spirit. Uh, I think there is no... Uh, no, no different in 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 in, in uh, point of view or uh, in uh, uh, in perspective. Uh, that's uh, what uh, what I get uh, uh, as uh, as impression, and that the the non-aligned movement is still very relevant uh, uh, for today and 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 the future. And as I well, there will be a very interesting. Uh, session uh, tomorrow on the assessment of 60 years of non-aligned movement from Western perspective, uh, uh, from Europe uh, especially. And what I have raised always is NATO and non-aligned movement both were born out from the Cold War and now they survive both NATO in Western side <laughs> and an allied movement and uh, outside the Western world. So why, why NAM and NATO continue to function? Uh, so uh, I think it, uh, it will be very interesting debate in Western perspective of that. Uh, so if there is no question anymore, I think we can end our first session. Huh? Uh, Monsieur Kudori yeah, Oui. Uh, ju juste avant de finir, uh, on... il y a eu un problème avec le lien Zoom. Uh, ouais. On a envoyé un mail uh, commun avec Aurore, avec uh, le nouveau lien Zoom, toutes Donc. les inscriptions ouais. et les problèmes connus uh, si, jamais, uh, si jamais les personnes ont une galère à se connecter au Zoom. Ouais. Uh, donc voilà, normalement, il devrait y avoir... Tout le monde devrait pouvoir se connecter au moins cet après-midi. D'accord, très bien. So, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it is my student who intervened uh, because many, many, many people could not join yeah. because of the link is not good. So they they try to to settle this problem and hopefully, hopefully uh, this afternoon everybody uh, can join. Uh, oh, I see a... Barzia raise hands. A new link has been shared. Yeah. Just very, very. Link. Uh, it's it's the same link. It's Sorry, now it's just the correct one. Can I? Oh, but it, it's okay. the, the 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 former one was wrong. So now it's yeah, it's the, basically the same link, but this one is working. And also on the mail you will find some instructions if you can't connect uh, properly. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, we will remain at your disposal. Yeah. So send message to secretariat. Okay. Uh, yes, Marzia. Marzia. No, just very briefly, Darvis, uh, yes. about what you are saying right now uh, about NATO and non-alignment. So 
Um, it's, for me, it's very interesting. And I think that we should raise this issue for the next conference. Yeah. Because you know that my point is that uh, NATO, as, as well as Asento and Seato, they were conceived uh, in order to counteract uh, what was going on in, in the developing country and in former colonial countries. So yes. that's, I think that we should develop also this perspective in an historical, you know, yeah. uh, from the, also from the historical point of view. That's for me personally, it's very interesting. Yes, so, good. Well, Marzia uh, is uh, uh, associate professor in history, Asian history and Torino University in Italy. It's yes. part of our uh, uh, group. Nice, nice to meet all, all guys that I, I never, I, I didn't <laughs> meet before. Bye, see you later. See you later. Bye. So, let's go to have lunch for those who are not fasting. <laughs> because it is uh, maybe for somebody, for someone, Fasting is always good. So uh, uh, have a nice lunch, and we go come back at uh, at what time? At uh, two o'clock, I think. Six o'clock. No, 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 no. I mean, you have to. Uh, you can connect starting from uh, what time? I check the the timetable. Yeah, you have lunch break until one thirty. And the session will start at 1.45, okay? 1.45 will start with the Yugoslavian Audiovisual Archive on Belgrade NAM Conference by Mila Turajlic, who is a Serbian filmmaker working on Yugoslavian Audiovisual Archive during Tito period. It will be very interesting. Unfortunately, of course, we, uh, she cannot share uh, the, uh, her film fully uh, because he made uh, several, he makes several films, interesting films uh, on uh, this uh, Yugoslavia during two Tito period and uh, the, the cameraman or the, the team, a film team of uh, Tito, okay? Uh, thank you very much. See you at uh, 145. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See thank you later. You. Thank, you. thank you. Excellent debate. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Davis.